Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 29, The Last Years of Henry III. Last episode we left Henry III at the height of his power. He had deposed three popes and put a new set of popes in place who responded to the great desire of Christendom, the reform of the church. The new popes would fight the corruption of simony, the licentiousness of priests and renew discipline in monasteries. In 1046, Henry III was not just master of the spiritual world, he also believed he had absolute dominion over his realm. O oh, Henry, cherish the moment, because this is not to last. We already heard that the Saxons were chafing under the rule of a southern overlord. Henry's policy of expanding the crown domain into Saxony and his support to the bishops of Hildesheim, Halberstadt and most of all Hamburg Bremen irritated the dukes of Saxony and its major nobles. In 1046, Markgraf Eckhard of Meissen, one of Saxony's wealthiest and most powerful magnates, died childless. When he bestowed all his possessions to Henry III, the Saxons saw the encroachment tightening further. At the same time, the Slavs to the east of the duchy resumed hostilities. The defending Saxon nobles did not receive any support from the emperor, and even the bishoprics in Saxony failed to contribute to the defense of the realm. In 1056, a major Saxon army was defeated near the mouth of the Havel River. A defeat blamed on the absent emperor and his hostile policy towards the ancient heartland of the empire. Miraculously, Saxony does not rebel. Yet. That is something that cannot be said about the recently subjugated Hungarians. In 1044, Henry III had fought the successful Battle of Menfe and had put King Peter Osceolo back on the throne. This improbable king of the Hungarians, whose father had been the Doge of Venice, had stubbornly continued the policies that had already lost him the throne once. As before, he relied on foreigners to govern the kingdom, mainly Germans and Italians, who received all the plum jobs, the rich heiresses and the splendid fiefs. Last time, the enraged Hungarians took only his crown and scepter and sent him on his merry way. This time, they hoped to accelerate the learning process by taking his eyesight. It remains unclear whether the treatment worked, since King Peter either passed shortly afterwards or ended his days in relative obscurity in Bohemia. The new king of Hungary was Andreas, son of Vasil, who was so brutally executed by Saint Stephen. Despite all possible grudges Andreas might have had against the emperor, he did send envoys with humble entreaties, offered subjugation to imperial rule and restitution for the treatment of Peter. Admittedly, Andreas did not have many options, since a pagan uprising was still raging across Hungary and he needed calm frontiers to sort that out. Henry III was given the choice between accepting Andreas as a new, if somewhat unruly vassal, or fighting to avenge the feckless Peter. He chose not to choose, which is probably the worst of all available options. Admittedly, he was distracted by events in Lothringia we will talk about in a second. Doing nothing was particularly bad, though, because it allowed Andreas to sort out his domestic issues without ending up in an obligation to the emperor. And when Henry III finally got round to attacking Hungary, Andreas had built a string of border defences and renewed his army. Between 1050 and 1053, Henry attacked Hungary every year without much success. Sometimes his troops are being lured deep into the great Hungarian plain until the supply lines become overstretched, making the starved soldiers on their emaciated steeds an easy prey for the fearsome horse archers. On other occasions, the Hungarians held out in their reinforced defensive structures, like the castle of Bratislava, until the emperor had to turn back home. Counterattacks into Bavaria followed, that will become costly, as you will see later. In between these military campaigns, the Hungarians would regularly offer peace and submission, provided the emperor accepts Andreas as king. I mean, even Pope Leo IX intervenes on Andreas' behalf, but Henry III remains stubborn. The inability of Henry III to bring the Hungarians to heel affects the whole of his Eastern European policy. The Polish Duke Casimir, who, 
after all, owes his throne to Henry III, is contemplating rebellion, aka refusal to pay tribute. Equally, the new Duke of Bohemia links up with Hungary in 1055, and then Andreas marries the daughter of Jaroslav, Grand Prince of Kiev, who had created a veritable network of allies surrounding Henry III. Jaroslav had married one of his daughters to the King of Norway and another to the King of France, after Henry III had refused that self-same daughter. So Henry III's Eastern European policy has not yet collapsed, but it's under severe threat. What stopped Henry III to go immediately after King Andreas of Hungary was another, ultimately unnecessary, fight. You remember that in 1046, just before going down to Rome, Henry III had released Godfrey the Bearded from his jail cell and reinstated him as Duke of Upper Lothringia. While in Rome, Henry issued another one of his peace proclamations, where he forgave all his enemies, and in turn expected everyone else to forgive those who had trespassed against them. Gottfried the Bearded was explicitly excluded from this act of mercy. A terrible affront that is hard to explain given that Henry III had just received Godfrey back into his grace. Despite this rudeness, Godfrey still towed the line and remained a faithful servant. That only changed when Dietrich, Count of Holland, continued his attempts to expand his territory at the expense of the empire and in particular the Bishop of Utrecht. Rumours were going round that the King of France had offered Dietrich support. Henry's attempt to bring Dietrich to heel fell short as he struggled with the waterlocked conditions in the Netherlands, and on his return, the locals were chasing the imperial troops with small boats like pirates and killed many. Seeing the mighty emperor flailing about, Godfrey saw a way to restore his honour. He joined Dietrich of Holland, who had gathered another set of magnates in his quest, Baldwin, Count of Flanders, and Hermann, Count of Eno or Hennegau in German. Now, pretty much all of the Netherlands, Belgium, plus what is today Lorraine, are in open revolt. They devastate the Imperial Pfalz in Nimwegen, one of the great residences inherited from Carolingian times. It is the residence where Theophano had died and where Henry III had gotten married in 1036. Meanwhile, Godfrey burns down the city of Verdun to the ground and many imperial castles fell to the conspirators. This is now a serious threat to the imperial rule. So what does Henry do? He raises a previously unknown count, Adalbert of Longwy, to be the new Duke of Upper Lothringia. That does not last long since Godfrey kills Adalbert in an ambush within a year. Henry III now appoints his brother, Gerard of Chatenois, to be the new duke. Just as an aside, his family would rule Lorraine until the 18th century and with Francis I's marriage to Maria Theresia become the ancestors of the Habsburgs in the male line. Not bad for a second-rate count. But apart from that great optionality, the Count of Chatenois gets very little in terms of help from the Emperor. The picture turned in Henry's favour after 1049. First, because the bishops of Utrecht, Liège and Metz gang up on Dietrich of Holland, lure him into a trap and kill him. Godfrey tries to take over Holland after Dietrich's demise, but gets expelled by these same bishops. These three bishops clearly not to be messed with. The other military support came when Henry could mobilise Danish and English ships against the Count of Flanders, whose expansion had raised concerns with the other states along the North Sea coast. The final blow came when Henry III took advantage of having a pet pope, in the form of Leo IX. Leo IX excommunicated both Baldwin of Flanders and Godfrey the Bearded. That was too much for Godfrey, who succumbed and surrendered to the imperial mercy in Aachen in 1049. Baldwin of Flanders held out a little bit longer, but finally had to give up and sign a peace agreement with Henry III. Now this may all look like a great outcome for Henry III, but by breaking the ducal authority in Lothringia, he also created a political vacuum. As it happened, the empire was either unwilling or unable to step into that vacuum, which ultimately led to a fragmentation of power in Lothringia that weakened the realm's western frontier. It did not take long for the problem to materialize. Not even 12 months to be precise. 
The ink on the agreement between Baldwin of Flanders and the Empire was barely dry when the cunning Count concocted his next move. He married his son and heir to the heiress of the county of Hainaut, or Hennigau in German. This brought Flanders a major dominion inside the Empire, to which Hainaut belonged. Under feudal law, the marriage would have required Henry III's consent, which he almost certainly would not have given. Marrying without it was a breach of the law. So, war returns. In 1053, Baldwin and his sons mount an aggressive attack into imperial territory, burning down the lands of the Bishop of Liège. Henry III retaliated in 1054 with a large army, but failed to dislodge the enemy from Hainaut. Situation is so dire that Henry III has to call Godfrey the Bearded back. Not that he makes him duke again, but he gets some of his lands back. He even gets a role in the war against Baldwin of Flanders. This gradual reconciliation may have been brought about by Pope Leo IX. Remember that Leo IX had been Bishop of Toul and has been close to the family of Godfrey the Bearded. Godfrey's brother, Frederick, was Leo IX's Chancellor. But that improvement in the relationship did not last. For once it was not Henry III's behaviour that led to the breakdown, but Godfrey himself. In 1054, Godfrey married Beatrix, widow of the Count Boniface of Canossa and Tuscany. Boniface was the most powerful secular lord in northern Italy. He was a creature of the imperial rule in Italy through and through. His family owed its rise from obscurity to Empress Adelheid, who awarded them with Mantua and other counties in the 960s. And Conrad II had awarded Boniface the mighty county of Tuscany in 1027. His relationship with the imperial house was further strengthened when he married Beatrix, a wealthy niece of Conrad II. His lands comprised a band of cities and fortresses going east to west across Italy, including Mantua, Parma, Reggio, Modena, Pisa, Lucca, Florence, Brescia and Verona. Imperial rule in Italy was simply unimaginable without Boniface's support. Boniface had stopped French ambitions on the Italian crown after Henry II's death, and he fought Odo of Blois for Conrad II. The relationship between Boniface and Henry III must have become fraught after the two men met for the first time in Florence in 1046. By 1047, Boniface opposed the emperor and supported a futile attempt by the ex-pope Boniface IX to return to Rome. When Boniface of Canossa died in a hunting accident slash ambush in 1052, rumours spread that Henry III had his hand in the game. There were other people who held a grudge against Boniface, who had conquered and burned many a city in Italy, so the rumour might well be unfounded. It might even have been the angry boar after all. But do you notice something here? A lot of Henry III's problems after 1046 stem from his stubbornness. Why did he insist on fighting King Andreas of Hungary, who was constantly trying to become his vassal? What is it Godfrey the Bearded had done to be excluded from the indulgence of 1046? And now he's clearly falling out with the most powerful vassal in Italy. Historians have two explanations. One is that Henry III had a notion of imperial dignity that did not allow the slightest compromise or challenge to his rule. Hence, King Peter, incompetent as he was, needed to be avenged. Godfrey and Boniface were simply too powerful to be tolerated. The other theory is that the change in behaviour came after his illness in 1045. During that illness, the magnates feared for the emperor's life and, since he had no son at the time, lined up a Count Palatinate as his successor just in case. It seems something in this period had changed Henry's personality and outlook that contributed to the tensions with his magnates. So, no bonus points for guessing Henry's reaction when he realizes his archenemy Godfrey had just got hold of a big chunk of northern Italy by marrying the widow of Boniface of Canossa. Imagine Godfrey teams up with the Normans who had just won the Battle of Civitate. Suddenly, Godfrey would be the master of Rome, and hence the master of the papacy. Godfrey tried to assure Henry of his unwavering loyalty, but there was nothing going. Henry mobilized all his supporters in Italy to oust Godfrey, 
which they managed even before the year 1054 was out. In 1055, when Henry came down to Rome for a second time, he had the Dowager Countess Beatrix and her daughter Matilda arrested and sent to Germany. Frederick, the heir to the lands of Boniface, died around the same time under mysterious circumstances, making Matilda the heiress to one of the largest territorial lordships in southern Europe. That makes her the Matilda of Tuscany, who will play such an important role in our narrative going forward. You would think that the Saxony grumbling, Hungary resisting, Lothringia and perennial revolt, and a key ally in northern Italy lost, this would be the full complement of late rule issues for an emperor. But no. You may remember that two episodes ago I said we would get back to the awarding of the southern duchies to major magnates. Now is the time. Henry III started his reign being Duke of Bavaria, Duke of Swabia, Duke of Carinthia, as well as King of Burgundy. By 1050, all these duchies had been granted to magnates. The only title that Henry keeps is King of Burgundy. According to Egon Bossov, the political logic was that the empire needed these mid-layers between the counts and lords on the one hand and the emperor on the other to function. Since Henry the Fowler, only one duchy had ever been dissolved, Franconia, after the rebellion against Otto the Great. But that did not last since the Salians established a power base within the old duchy of Franconia that effectively replaced it. Given the fact duchies are necessary, Henry III decided to hand them to magnates whose main possessions lay outside the duchy. That way the new duke would be dependent upon the emperor, or so he thought. By 1052 the Duke of Bavaria is Conrad, member of the powerful Edzonian family. The Edzonians, or descendants of Edzo, had their main territories along the Rhine north of Cologne. By now there were no longer nouveau reach, but of the highest nobility, tracing their line back to Otto the Great. Conrad of Bavaria, like his most recent predecessors, had been appointed directly by the Emperor, without regard to the ancient Bavarian tradition that allowed for an election of their Duke. All that should have made sure that Conrad had little support amongst the Bavarian nobility. Now what happens next is a bit unclear. Some sources talk about a personal clash between Conrad and Henry over a marriage proposal, so personality problem again, but there's also the question of what to do with regards to Hungary. Bavaria was the main battlefield of the Hungarian War, which caused a lot of damage. It seems Conrad could not quite see the point of perennial, unwinnable conflict for the sake of revenge for an inept and now long-dead former king. On this point he clashed with Gebhard, Bishop of Regensburg, who took a hard line. The feud between Gebhard and Conrad escalated into full-on revolt by the Duke, who found support amongst the Bavarian nobles who were tired of having their lands raided. Henry III now deposes Conrad, who flees to Hungary. And he then awards the duchy successively to his two-year-old son Henry, then to Henry's little brother, and finally to his own wife, Agnes of Poitou. Now when Gebhard of Regensburg did not get the regency over Bavaria, he joined the rebels as well, as did Duke Welf of Carinthia. This is now a major, major problem. The conspirators are putting plans together to have Henry murdered and Conrad to be made king. This plan would have had a good chance of succeeding given the issues in Saxony and Lothringia and the fact that Henry III's heir was a child of four or five years at the time. Luckily for Henry, the rebellion collapsed when the main instigators, Conrad of Bavaria and Welf of Carinthia, died in 1055. Gebhard of Regensburg is put in jail, but returns to his bishopric after a year. Another conspirator ends up as Duke of Carinthia in 1056. This highlights the big difference between the way the emperors manage their realm and the way the French kings go about it. No French king in the 11th to 13th century would ever in his wildest dreams hand over a vacant duchy or county to another magnate, unless forced. Because the French nobles are constantly at war with the king, the logic for the king is to grab hold of any plot of land he can get his hands on and build an infrastructure that allows him to administrate this land without ever having to enfeef it to someone else. 
and when Philippe Auguste in the 13th century rebuilds the French monarchy, he takes over the Duchy of Normandy and the County of Toulouse and incorporates those into the crown lands. Compared to France, the empire is largely at peace. And the prevailing ideology is that the empire is run through a consensus between the emperor and his major vassals, who give him support in war and advice in peacetime. Yes, the emperors did try to build a territorial structure in the crown lands of Saxony around Goslar and in Franconia around Speyer, but that is small fry compared with whole duchies they often held in their hands. They did not create a bureaucracy that could manage a whole duchy directly on their behalf. It seems that ducal positions had to be granted to members of the highest nobility to maintain that semblance of consensual rule. The empress, however, increasingly relied on the church to provide administration, military support and a counterbalance to the dukes. Now talking about the church, Henry III even managed to weaken that pillar of his realm. The first incidents involved the bishops of Cambrai. The bishops' lands had been subject to raids by the rebels in the endless Lothringian wars. One of his particular scourges was his neighbour, Jean of Arras. At some point in the fighting, Henry III needed the support of John of Arras. He offered John the role of Count of Cambrai, if he would switch sides. Henry may well have thought that the Bishop of Cambrai would accept that tactical decision, but he did not. Henry, caught between his promise to John and his obligations to the loyal bishop, took the wrong decision. He forced the bishop to accept John using force. That caused no end of concern amongst the bishops of Lothringia, who had been the main combatant on the imperial side. Equally, Bishop Vaso of Liege found himself exposed to imperial displeasure when he signed a truce with Godfrey the Bearded after a very long siege and after the emperor had failed to send relief. These may be minor issues caused by a lack of understanding of the political situation in Lower Lothringia. But there is a broader context that causes the churchmen to question their position. We have no data on how severe the imperial demands for military assistance from the bishops and abbots were in 1050, but if already by 982 the majority of imperial troops were raised by bishops and abbots, it is likely that after a further 70 years of imperial church policy, the army was predominantly, if not exclusively, provided by the church. We did hear about the abbot of Fulda's complaint to send even more soldiers after the previous contingent had been all but wiped out. Polemic against the burden of military service on the churches is circulating, and at a synod in Reims, presided over by Pope Leo IX, the bishops reiterate the ancient ban on military service for the clergy. Equally, churchmen begin to question the level of involvement of the emperor in the management of the church. It is again Vaso of Liege who wanders in 1046 on what grounds Henry III can remove the correctly ordained Archbishop of Ravenna. And equally, is it really the emperor's job to depose three popes in Sutri before appointing another? Aren't the spiritual and the secular realms separate, one ruled by the Pope and the other by the Emperor? Vaso is otherwise staunchly loyal supporter of the Emperor, even questions the value of the anointment of the King. It is, he argues, not the same as the anointment of a bishop, whose aim is to give life and access to eternal life, whilst the King's anointment gives him the right to condemn people to death. Anonymous treatises start to circulate which condemn Henry III for his uncanonical marriage to Agnes of Poitou, who he was too closely related to. This incestuous marriage, it argues, makes him an infamous, a man without honour, who cannot even sit in judgment over laymen, let alone judge clerics or even popes. And when the abbot Hallinard is elevated to Archbishop of Lyon in 1046, he refuses to swear the customary oath of fealty. Halimard argues that his obligation is to first and foremost to God and the diocese, so swearing fealty to the emperor would be perjury. Henry III had to accept Halimard's refusal and invests him without oath. The fact that the marriage to Agnes of Poitou was uncanonical is a recurring issue in the relationship with the church, and it undermines Henry's position as the leader of the church reform. 
The abbot of the important reform monastery of Gauls publicly and privately criticizes the marriage and the whole atmosphere is caught and even Henry's choice of advisers. In Rome, Pope Leo IX is disappointed in the lacklustre support he received for his plans to fight the Normans, because Henry III offered only a small number of troops and allowed ambitious men to follow the papal flag, which attracted rogues and adventurers rather than proper fighting men who ran for cover at Civitate. Towards the end of his reign, Hermann of Reichenau, our most reliable chronicler, writes, quote, At this time, both the foremost man and the lesser man of the kingdom began more and more to murmur against the emperor. They complained he had long since departed from his original conduct of justice, peace, piety, fear of God and manifold virtues, in which he ought to have made progress from day to day. That he was gradually turning towards acquisitiveness and a certain negligence, and that he would become much worse than he was before. Henry III died on October 5, 1056, at his palace in Botfeld in the Harz Mountains, aged just 39. He leaves behind his eldest son, Henry IV, who is just six years old when his father succumbs. Henry III had tried for a son for a very long time. His first wife Gunhild only provided him with a daughter, and Agnes of Poitou bore him three daughters before the long-desired son arrived in November 11th, 1050 in Goslar. Henry III must have already known that he had not much time left. He made his noble swear fealty to the newborn and again at his christening a year later. In July 1054 the now four-year-old was anointed and crowned by the Archbishop of Cologne in Aachen, making him king alongside his father. He had been elected in Tribur in 1053. All this looks smooth though the election of Henry IV had an unusual quirk. The nobles elected him and swore to serve him for as long as he reigned as a just king. In other words, they reserved the right to refuse suit in case young Henry IV does not turn out a good king who respects the rights of the nobility. Well, we will find out in the next few episodes whether Henry IV is going to live up to these standards whether the foremost and the lower men of the kingdom will give him suit as the just king when it's most crucial. But before we go there, I have something special for you. As you know, the History of the Germans podcast has no advertising and I have no intention to go down that route in the future. However, what I'm happy to do is to help promote other podcasters whose work I respect and admire. Hence, Next week you will find episode 1 of the Thugs and Miracles podcast by Benjamin Bernier in your feed. Benjamin is an exceptional storyteller who has taken it upon himself to bring you the story of France from the fall of the Roman Empire to the fall of the guillotine. In his more than 50 episodes to date, he brings the ancient kingdom of the Franks to life. As you may know, I am not a huge fan of the so-called Dark Ages and have skipped over them somewhat casually. Listening to Benjamin, I'm wondering whether that was such a good idea. There are some truly fabulous stories there I missed. But only because I missed out does not mean you have to miss out. So listen in to Thugs and Miracles next week. And I will be back on air on September 9th. See you then. <laughs>